morning, everybody. Um, let's get straight into Tech Talk this morning. Um, our topic, national building regulations. Um, we have had requests and we've had inquiries uh, from contractors um, dealing with these issues. I know our ops are spending, we are spending quite a bit of time on getting the construction element uh, or the construction plumbing element up and running, getting the guys prepared, uh, getting them ready to, to enter the construction environment without risk. Um, there are obvious risks in anything you do. So for my next three sessions, we're going to be running through the building regulations as it applies to our members and as it applies to uh, the plumbing industry. So just a quick, the full title of the document, National Building Regulations and Building Standards Act, number 103 of 1977. And then you'll see it says there as amended. So instead of rewriting this monster document all the time, every time there's a revision, or there's something that needs to be changed, uh, there's a simple amendment made to a specific portion of the document. And that amendment then just gets captured together with all the other information already part of the document. So they don't rewrite the whole regulation every time something happens. And basically the same applies because you'll see SANS 10400, which is the document um, that the building control officer would use in assessing your building plans. And then obviously at the end or during construction and completion, your assessment of the work on site will all be done from that SANS 10400 document. So 10400 uh, into 25 little, well, I say 25 little, 25 sections. And we'll be dealing with those sections individually by name and as and how they apply to what we do as plumbers. So without further ado, let's start off by asking why we actually need to have uh, knowledge of this document. Um, why do we actually need to be even aware that it's there? Besides the fact that your local authority will use this to assess your work and uh, assess work on site where you're busy, we as contractors or we as plumbers as as professionals have to familiarize ourselves with the contents of this important document it is one that they use not only for building control but for all legal cases for all um, uh, 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 what do they call arbitration cases between contractors anything go wrong on anything construction related this document is called up immediately so we also need to become aware of what's important towards successful completion of any project and how your business fits into this whole process. You can't come there after the effect once the foundations are cast and floors are cast and start cutting and breaking to get a drain pipe in that was supposed to be under floor that was supposed to happen before that stage of the floor being cast. So we need to fit ourselves or we need to position ourselves into uh, where we can actually make sure that we on site and we don't delay or we don't end up costing ourselves money. We don't expose our company to unnecessary risks due to any type of claims relating to damages, delays. Like I said, we don't want to be that party that holds the whole process back as far as construction is concerned. And then more importantly for the guys that are like, um, like Steve and myself and then we, we, the guys that go but OCD, we try to anticipate any impact on your work caused by other contractors and processes that are on site. Um, it boils down to you can have 20 guys standing on the verge, pick and shovel in hand, but you're not going to get onto site until X, Y, and Z is done. So it's important to have these things um, organized. And then more importantly, Right at the inception stage, when this whole process starts off, you'll be able to assess the whole proposal and the impact on the plumbing work you will be held responsible for. In other words, if there's any uh, scaffolding going up, you have to get your trench work done before five-story or six-story scaffolds go up because you'll never get to that trench until all the scaffolding is broken down and you'll be working Saturdays and Sundays to try and make up time. That's a stupid example, but basically we need to be aware of where what fits into the whole thing. So I would just like to, as far as plumbing is concerned, there's a simple example. 
This is an extract from the actual building regulations and standards act as amended. So you'll see A18, most of us are familiar with it. Um, no person shall perform the trade of plumbing unless he or she is a trained plumber or works under the adequate control of a trained plumber or an approved competent person. And then we go through the whole process and let me just get my hand out here. Here we go. So you'll see this is the example from the building regulation. But if we now go to SANS 10400, which is your building inspectors or your building control officers, um, I don't want to say Bible, but their guide in life, uh, that example, then 10400 part A under admin, it also says A18. And it basically repeats what was said in the building regulation. So whether you get your hands on the copy of the building regulations or whether you get the application of the building regulations, the gist of both documents are exactly the same. The only difference is that under the act or with the, with the national building regulation itself, it tells you what needs to happen. It tells you when it needs to happen. And when you go to 10400, the application will then tell you what the minimum deemed to satisfy requirements are for you to be able to actually um, apply what was required. So if we go straight into that application document, you'll see that, like I said, 25 part document, and you'll see it covers any and everything from admin, which we the, the open portion. So all the other relevant ones uh, will work our way through this uh, during the next three sessions. But you'll see some of them have got everything to do with plumbing. Some of them have got very little to do with plumbing. But somewhere along the line, there is a thread that runs through both of these documents that will affect us ultimately as construction plumbers. So this part of 10400, in other words, part A, is for is in is for uh, to enable designers to design buildings that comply. So we don't work on matchboxes. We don't work on high-rise buildings that are going to fall apart when people start chasing and, and installing services. So the building needs to comply. The contractors to construct buildings and their subsystems. Here comes the plumber for the first time. Subsystems using conventional materials and construction techniques in accordance with practices that are deemed to satisfy. So uh, if it's something new, if it's something uh, experimental, then obviously it would be an engineer's uh, or a, a rational design. But if it's a standard practice or it is a practice that comes out of this document, it would be acceptable. And then more importantly, if you now leave your parish where you're used to working in Bloemfontein and you'd like to come and work in Port Elizabeth, the local authorities to establish compliance in a uniform and consistent manner. You don't want to leave the area where you work because you've submitted a tender to do work in the Western Cape and you're from the, the KZN and then you run into Western Cape and you find that they have a complete different set of rules. Not supposed to be like that. These are national building regulations. So the regulations should be enforced in a uniform and consistent manner. And then just a quick touch base while we're still under the admin, um, you'll find most BCOs and most local authorities will tell you there's no water in the building regulations. They are 100% correct. The only water referred to in the building regulations at this stage is fire water. It's part W, which is a, a, an animal and a beast of, on its own. But in B12 of SANS 10400 Part A, it actually says that the Water Services Act enables the Minister of Water Affairs to prescribe compulsory national standards relating to consumer installations. And a consumer is an end user who receives water services from a water services institution, sorry, institution, including an end user in an informal settlement. So those RTP houses or those houses being built under projects, they all still fall under the Water Services Act. And then importantly, a consumer installation uh, is regarded as a pipeline fitting apparatus installed or used by a consumer to gain access to water and includes a meter attached to that pipeline fitting or apparatus. And then um, regulation 14 of the Water Services Act quoted in here just says that every consumer installation must comply with SANS 10251, 10252.1 and 
SANS 10254, the installation, maintenance, replacement of fixed heaters, and any or other substituting reenactment or amendment thereof. So as far as water concerned, we are part of those documents and our documents that we work to are indeed referenced by the Water Services Act. And you'll find them under the normative references in the actual document, you'll find them as well. So if we skip all the admin, I'm not gonna bore you with the admin. Um, as far as your copy or as far as your reference to the admin is concerned, you'll find that it's got all the terminology in there, it's got the uh, references in there, it's got the abbreviations, all the admin. It's got symbols for drawings. Um, when we talk, uh, I keep making fun of, of certain individuals, but uh, they must forgive me. We don't talk about a thingy that sits at, at the back of another thingy. We go and we find the proper terminology and we refer to those things as we go along because we are professionals. We don't work with thingies. We work with either a joint or a fitting or a something that is culpable that you can actually tell someone this is where we're heading to. So part B, we're not going to hang around too much on it. It deals with structural design. So to give an idea of structural design, you can imagine the amount of concrete and reinforcing and suspension and calculations on these uh, designs of these big buildings are concerned. But it's not only pertaining to that big building. Here's a, another extract from that same part P, something that we deal with regularly or something that we get to deal with regularly. So you'll see figure B4, which is part of that section B, test fittings for heavy weight. So what we've got is a standard bracket. And you'll find that when we refer to uh, heavyweight fittings, um, required where there's a high probability that people will stand upon the fittings, i.e. wash troughs, sanitary wear basins, geysers, and fire hose reels. So it, that means that is structurally that wall or that portion of wall could be tested by adding 136 kilos on that angle or on that uh, cantilevered bracket that would be considered acceptable as a test. Why do we actually worry about this test? because not every geezer that comes off a wall is the plumber's fault. You can see I highlighted the fact that the, the bolt is still there. Obviously, there's a problem with the either the, the structural integrity of the brick or the wall itself or the dugger, whatever happened there. Not every geezer that comes down is the plumber's fault. We might get blamed for it, but it's not always like that. So there are aspects to each of these components that we're going to go to that will ultimately affect the way the plumber operates. So I just want to open this thing here. Just see. There we go. So part C uh, would be dimensions. Like I said, you'll find these are more applicable to the actual designers, minimum sizes, minimum head height, openings, um, clear space, um, various aspects of buildings to, pertaining to dimensions that the designers and the building control officers actually have to comply to. Uh, public safety, uh, also very um, important when it comes to design. We're looking at change of levels. We're looking at uh, ramps. We're looking at um, making sure that the buildings that we that we not only work on but that we end up handing over to the client is indeed safe to be used without any hazard then the bit that most plumbers enjoy most um, part e demolition work demolition work is not simply going down to your local hardware store and buying a couple of hammers or if you're really lazy getting a, a, a jackhammer or a or a uh, and another piece of equipment to break a building down. There are rules or there are regulations in as far as uh, demolition work is concerned, applications, etc. So all I'm going to say about Part E in 10400 will be that in 2014, there were construction regulations published. Then after 2014, the construction regulations, they not never superseded the, 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 the SANS 10400, but as an addition to, because part E was never updated. So when we're demolishing a specific building, so in a run to one or two of the highlights, uh, or one of the more important ones, must appoint a competent person in writing 
to supervise and control all demolition work on site. Contractor must ensure that before any demolitions carried out in order to ascertain the method, method to be used, a detailed structural engineering survey. If it's a high rise building, um, then obviously you'll be breaking it down in stages, hinting or, or leaning more towards certain aspects than others. During demolition, a competent person as contemplated in SAB Regulation 1 must check the structural integrity of the structure at intervals. In other words, we don't want buildings to be demolished out of uh, we've all seen those whatsapp funny whatsapp videos where the guy's breaking the floor and the whole thing collapses it's only funny until someone gets seriously hurt or someone dies then it becomes a criminal case so a contract contractor who performs demolition work must with regards to uh, a structure being demolished take steps to ensure that no floor roof or other part of the structure is overloaded with debris or in material that would render it unsafe so you'll see, you can read through this whole thing as discussed just now. You can see what's happening here. We're going to end up with bits and pieces that will end up down on the floor, hopefully with no one next to it. So we can go through this whole uh, document. It's, a, it's a, a free PDF download. If you want to do yourself a favor, Google it, get the construction regulations. It falls under our national documents library. You can download it. It deals with very many aspects of construction, uh, trenching, shoring, overloading of material, overloading of certain portions of the building. You can imagine the staircase was designed to take people up and down there if you start adding material onto that um, and you'll find that the platforms you'll find that remember these staircases while the building is still in use is still an emergency escape or it's still an entrance into the building so going up and down the staircase is not going to be a very safe uh, action as things stand there now so very important part e um, part f site operations uh, you'll find that there's a number of requirements. When it says site operations, it basically starts with from site setup to uh, site cleanup when the guys leave. Um, sanitary facilities, that's normally the first time the plumber gets called. We've got a construction site. We need sanitary, to, we need toilets. So they'll be facited so that they're not offensive. They'll be maintained and cleaned and less uh, permanent nature be removed immediately once the building's been completed. So you'll find that a lot of times they, there's an argument at the end of the project, who cleans what? And the easiest way normally these things are resolved is no one gets paid until the site is cleaned. So there's a, a, a general tendency to overlook the importance of this document. Um, we start off damage to local authorities property. I'm sure we can agree in this day and age, uh, no municipality can afford or no local authority can afford any damage to their property. Uh, fixing it is normally very expensive and the recovering cost is one of the biggest issues because you don't want to start a project a couple of thousand rand down or 50,000 rand down because you broke a HV, HD cable or something like that. So there's a whole list of starting out with the damages to the property, which when you go look at the, the recording afterwards, you can work your way through that. And then we'll find that if you once you made aware of the local authorities property, you'll find that when it comes to preparation of site, if it's waterlogged, um, you'll find that seasonally or permanently waterlogged sites where the building is situated that water will drain towards it the drainage shall be provided to direct water away from that site or around the building it is something that um, is overlooked often until the paint starts peeling etc and then we have to start excavating to get back to that level so we can actually get rid of that subsoil water so it's covered under the uh, operations and something that um, I've been nabbed for before because we don't take cognizance of this. Uh, the owner of the land on which excavation is in progress or on which any building work, work is erected or demolished shall take precautions in the area to limit a reasonable level the amount of dust arising from the work. And then also no person shall work during the course of any building demolition or excavation work uh, on any machine, machinery, engine, apparatus, tool, or contrivance, which in the opinion of the local authority may unreasonably disturb or interfere with the amenity of the neighborhood. 
So we don't want to upset Mrs. Jones uh, by starting up a compressor on a public holiday or a Sunday before six and after five on a Saturday and before six and after six on any other day, but for the two that I've just mentioned. So a normal working day, six to six, six to five on a Saturday and no work on a holiday or a Sunday. The nice thing about this is that if you know the rules and you play by the rules, you'll be aware or you'll be, um, yeah, you'll be aware of the fact that you can actually apply for permission to do that. The only way or the only time that you're allowed to work outside of those times is when it's urgently necessary to preserve life, safety, or health of a person. In other words, if someone got work, was working there during the normal working hours and something collapsed or they got caught somewhere or they stuck somewhere, you'd be allowed to work because it's health and safety of a person. It's urgently necessary to preserve property. In other words, this building might come collapsing down or there might be some structural issues that need to be resolved. It's fine. And then it has been authorized by the local authority. In other words, you can put an application, you can go to the neighbors to say, we need to break down or we need to demolish or we need to transfer, then we'll be working our way through this thing for maybe an hour extra every five or for the next five days. And then you'll be sorted out. And then most importantly, like most of these regulations and acts end up saying that anyone who contravenes a provision of this regulation shall be guilty of an offense. So it is a, a serious enough matter to consider. Waste material. Same thing applies, it stays on yours, not on the verge, definitely not in the roadways, not on your neighbor's property. And then the uh, cleaning of site, like I said at the beginning, uh, it will be done within a specified period of that notice being served on that site. So it will be your problem if there's any of your material lying around there, it will be your problem. So you'll see there's a set of rules with regards to boulder sheds. Uh, most most of the bigger companies use containers, the truck delivers, the truck picks it up and leaves. Uh, but as soon as you start building little sheds and shacks all over for whatever type of material, then there are rules and regulations to play by. Sanitary facilities. No person shall commence or continue the erection or demolition of any building unless approved sanitary facilities for all personnel employed on or in connection with such work have been provided. It used to be, well, um, historically, it was acceptable to see five guys each facing in a different direction, determining what they would consider the backside of a column or the backside of a tree would be to actually do this. But guys, uh, and uh, for if there are any ladies in the room, times have changed. We have got female representation in our workforce. 3% of our country's plumbers at the moment are female. We don't end up doing those things anymore. We are, we've, we've um, evolved away from that. So we provide and you'll see an approved facility is not a hole in the ground. It's either using that existing connection, you could use chemical toilets, you could use whichever uh, option you prefer, as long as we make sure that we comply with what happens there um, or with the requirements. So once again, if you don't comply, you'll be guilty of an offense. I see we've hit 25 minutes past. Um, have we got any questions, Karim? Thank you, Adrian. Yes, we do have uh, just one question from Lawrence. Uh, this regulation, is it the NHBRC? Uh, no, uh, the NHBRC is the is a council. It's a it's a body on their own. This 10400 is the application of the building regulations. The NHBRC is supposed to assess and inspect according to this document. So it's a document used by them, but it's not not NHBRC. Okay, perfect. I believe that's uh, all the questions from my side. Is there anything okay. you'd like to add, uh, Audrey? Uh, no, I'm 100%. Uh, uh, next time we'll get started on uh, excavations because that would be where most of us get involved in what we do on site. So I'll let you off easy with two, three minutes to spare. Um, next time I'll grab the three minutes back. Okay, keep safe, guys.